Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on a vital set of issues. I'm Clayton Duby of the USC US China Institute, and we're delighted that today's program is a joint venture with our friends and colleagues at the USC Center for Transnational Law and Business. Uh, today, we're looking at innovation and competition policy. Innovation, of course, is of critical importance. We must innovate if we are to increase productivity uh, so that we can address pressing needs. Of course, we all want innovation uh, to bring us the, the newest, the latest, uh, greater convenience, greater flexibility, those sorts of things. But productivity increases are vital if we want to raise living standards. They're vital to address the needs of aging populations and shrinking labor pools. And of course, they're essential if we're going to address issues of environmental degradation. We have to produce using fewer raw materials, less energy, and we have to make greater use of renewables. Competition is usually seen as a key driver of innovation. And so today we're looking at American and Chinese policies and actions regarding innovation and competition. Recent headlines, of course, highlight the centrality of these topics. There is some common ground. In both societies, we're worried about the dominance of a few mega corporations. There's concern about access to key components and technologies. We're worried about how to develop the talent needed, how to cultivate, recruit this talent. Can future innovation and competition help us to reduce the inequalities in our societies? Or will innovation and competition policy uh, and, and progress further exacerbate that inequality? In the US, of course, there are contentions over uh, the government support for innovation and competition aspects of various spending plans. Uh, there's worries about appointments to regulatory bodies. We have investigations into uh, corporations and whether or not the size and spread of these corporations is good for the United States. And of course, there's concerns over protecting intellectual property created uh, by American firms, by Americans. In China, of course, We've seen the headlines, Alibaba, Meituan, Baidu, Didi, and Tencent, household names, have been fined or otherwise sanctioned for running afoul of various regulatory uh, expectations. Uh, and we have those kinds of concerns. Both countries see the other as a key rival in fields that may represent the 21st century's economic and strategic higher ground. These are essential topics that we're looking in today. And our discussion is going to address them. Leading the conversation is Brian Peck, uh, who teaches at the USC Gold School, for law, Gold School of Law and directs the Center for Transnational Law and Business. Brian has worked in both uh, international business and in government at the federal and state levels. He'll introduce our speakers and will moderate the discussion. Brian, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Clay. Uh, appreciate that uh, warm introduction and for your setting the stage for our discussion this afternoon or this evening. We really appreciate that. And we appreciate the collaboration with your institute and our center in putting this program together. We look forward to a very robust and interesting discussion. Our center is focused on innovation and IP and the role that competition policy and antitrust enforcement have in either fostering or hindering innovation and in intellectual property rights. And so we'll focus on that in our discussion this, this afternoon. I'm gonna introduce each of our panelists individually. Um, I'm gonna ask them to give some opening re brief remarks and observations, then we'll get into the moderated discussion and then open up the floor to questions. So our first panelist is Mark Cohen. Mark is a distinguished senior fellow director and lecturer for Asia IP Project at the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology at UC Berkeley Law School. He has a very long and distinguished career in both government and private sector as one of the leading experts, if not the leading expert in the US on China IPR issues. Mark, welcome. Thank to you. The program and thank you for joining us. We look forward to your expertise. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Clay. It's a pleasure to be with Curdy and Elizabeth as well. So I'm, I'm going to give a very brief overview of some of the um, IP issues, particularly some of the ones that uh, you may be less familiar with, because uh, there's plenty of them that are not on the headlines of the newspapers. Uh, and I'm going to just give you kind of four or five central themes just to think about, because these are also issues that very clearly affect innovation. One is China has a very statist approach to intellectual property. Now, intellectual property is a private property right, and most people don't even think of a role of the state other than perhaps if you have to go to court or go to customs to enforce your rights. Uh, in China, IP is part of state planning. There are five-year or 15-year IP plans, uh, and it's incorporated in a very granular way uh, where China wants to go in technology, particularly recently in addressing what China calls bottleneck technology, technology controlled by foreign companies. And it also is reflected in a second key aspect, which is that there's a high level of public enforcement of intellectual property. Uh, as you would expect in a statist approach, uh, a kind of socialist approach, which is the way it's described in the patent law or the antitrust law, uh, you have a lot of uh, public enforcement. You have about 70 times more criminal cases on intellectual property in China than in the United States, even though the US complains about lack of criminal enforcement. You have a very active antitrust regime. We'll be hearing about that later. And you have a vast administrative enforcement regime that brings uh, well over 100,000 cases per year, including in areas like patents, which is probably 50 to 60,000 patent cases per year. This is astronomical. Uh, third point, this is a complex regime. China has more litigation in IP than the United States. Indeed, I suspect than the rest of the world combined. Its patent office, its trademark office, its plant variety office, you go down the list, are larger than everywhere else. And in most cases, probably larger than the rest of the world combined. It's a sophisticated regime. People are well-trained. Many of them have PhDs in the field. And it's not to be underestimated. Uh, and this, it presents itself as a competitive rival with a high degree of sophistication, at least on the law, the trade rules, et cetera. Uh, and I say this because many Americans, if we had this program 20 years ago, would think China has no laws, it's a lawless place, the judges don't know anything. And that kind of underestimation uh, uh, will only serve to harm you as an academic or as a business official. It's a sophisticated regime. Uh, next point I wanna make is about the enforcement environment. And just to break this down in a, into a couple of points. First of all, in general, based on published data, a foreigner will win litigation in China more often than a Chinese entity, and more often in many cases than he would win in comparable cases in his home country. The win rate, if you will, on patent litigation for foreigners about three years ago was about 84%. This is very, very high. Uh, 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 yet, China also has a low utilization rate. Foreigners do not litigate much in China. In fact, foreigners are a relatively small part of the Chinese IP environment. And we can speculate, we could probably have a whole separate program on this topic, uh, but it's fascinating to observe that currently, according to official data, foreigners are probably less than 1% of the Chinese civil intellectual property docket. So this is really uh, an unusual and perhaps unhealthy environment. The last point I'd like to make, and I'm going to make this simply because it's counterintuitive, even though it doesn't uh, uh, greatly affect uh, American enterprises, particularly big ones that are concerned about the huge Chinese market, is that another distinguishing characteristic of China's IP regime, and even its, its enforcement regime, is a uh, focus on small enterprises. China has more individuals owning patents in a given year, applying for patents in a given year, than the US files patents in total from all places uh, uh, at the US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, uh, and it's also true of litigation uh, uh, that uh, uh, there's a, about a 30% cohort of small inventors that file patent cases. And there's a big focus on making the system available to the little guy. China's utility model system, which is kind of a petty patent system, is the largest in the world by a long shot. And similarly, uh, 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 is intended to facilitate small inventors filing for IP. All of this makes the Chinese IP environment actually rather different from what you hear in the press, and maybe if you think about it, a little more troubling. Uh, this is a sophisticated environment, 
uh, uh, where foreigners can sometimes win, but at the same time, it seems that when they lose, they lose big. And I suspect that part of the reason for that is when the state has its finger on its innovation needs, you may find that the scales of justice get a little bit distorted. But hopefully we'll have more time to talk about that after the next speakers. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate your insights and expertise and in peeking in a little bit more in depth on what's going on in China in terms of the IPR uh, situation over there. So appreciate that and look forward to your participation in our discussion. Our next panelist is Elizabeth Wang. She's the Executive Vice President for Compass Lexicon, which is a global economics consulting firm. She specializes in antitrust and IP issues. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you. Uh, many thanks to USC for hosting this important event and special thanks to Brian for inviting me to join this distinguished panel. It's it truly a privilege to me, uh, especially to be part of this, uh, Mark and Curdy. Um, when I was asked to, to talk on this panel, I immediately remembered my several talk with Mark Cohen in the spring of 2017. And we have covered similar issues back then. And here are some of the, the, the topics uh, back then. US-China, competition and collaboration, strategies for years ahead. Here's another one, innovation, and IP in China, what American business need to know. So four years, four and a half years has passed. A lot has happened since then. We have the pandemic, we had a new administration and we have China US tension increased. Um, but I think it may make sense to revisit some of the principles or fun, fun, fundamentals what we were talking four years ago. And that may help to facilitate our discussion later in the guided uh, topics. So I want to make two points, two observations uh, about China. The first one is that um, China, Chinese economy as of now, similar as four years ago, is still in the transition stage from the planned economy to the market economy. So what does it mean? Two things, at least. One, um, Chinese government agency still have very much a strong flavor of the mindset of planning. So we will talk about that much later. And it, so it makes what in the America, the invisible hands, the market will work things out. That mindset is still many times quite foreign to Chinese mindset. So that's one implication. The second implication is that in China, there are two very, very different group of companies, the state-owned enterprises and the private-owned companies. So you may have heard, um, and Clay mentioned earlier to opening this program, the Alibaba's, the Meituan, the Didi, those are private-owned companies. And you have heard of them quite a bit. And there are the state-owned enterprises in the tech space. You've probably not heard as much. But I'll, I'll give you uh, some, some quick examples. They're not in tech space, but China Mobile and uh, China First Auto Work FAW. And that's one of the, uh, the top Chinese auto space state-owned enterprises. So those two groups are quite different. So we need to be aware there are such, there are there, there are different animals out there. The second observation I would like to make is more along the line of the IP um, issues. Um, historically, for many years, Chinese companies, entities, individuals, they are primarily IP users and not really IP creators. Being IP creators is something relatively new even though it, in the last decade also, it changed very, very fast, like Mark has mentioned earlier. But um, this um, changes of using IP versus creating IP, and that changed the incentive of enforcing or protecting IPRs significantly. 
I just want to mention that many of the differences we see, we need to think about, is it truly a China issue or is it just owning, creating versus using issue? So I want to make those two points um, and, and about the context of the Chinese economy and Chinese companies. And then later when we talk about specific topics, it may make sense, a lot of discussion where I come from. Go ahead, get back to you, Brian. Great, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And we certainly look forward and appreciate your perspective from the China side in our discussions later on uh, during the program. Our third panelist is uh, Kirti Gupta. Kirti is the Vice President for Technology and Economic Strategy at Qualcomm Incorporated, where she and her team provide economic analysis and thought leadership on global technology, intellectual property, and antitrust economic policy issues. She's a very seasoned economist, engineer, and industry expert with around 20 years of Fortune 500 um, companies. So Kirti, very w welcome. It's great to have you with us and we look forward to your opening observations. Thank you, Brian, and everybody else at Team USC for teaming this up. I think it's a really timely event. We are obviously here today because you know, we're in a technological race with China. Um, and I would like to just start this conversation from the point of view of wireless technologies. That is what we do at Qualcomm. Uh, we've been transforming the world with wireless technologies over 30 years. And I would you know, bring it back to the innovation economy and the IP trends that we're talking about. Um, look, I mean, with every generation of wireless G, I think there has been sort of this major shift in the industry. And uh, now there are more uh, mobile subscriptions today than people on the planet. That has been the wireless revolution. But right now we are at the cusp of this technology we call 5G, uh, fifth generation G or 5G, that I think is a paradigm shift. It's different from other generations or Gs in the world in the sense, in, in the past, in the sense that it isn't just about connecting people. It's about connecting everything, everywhere, from your smart homes to smart cities, enterprises, cars, um, hospitals, uh, in, in that way, it is the universal fabric of connectivity, the infrastructure of our future connected world, if you will. And, you know, when Clay was giving this talk about innovation is the key to driving economic growth, I think 5G is coming at such an important time in the world because it, it, it's exactly that kind of general purpose technology that we need right now. You know, economists have been concerned about innovation being on the slowdown, productivity being on the slowdown over the last half century, because it's as if those kinds of technologies that create that multiplier effect, you know, are few and far between. But 5G is one of them. It transforms industries. So why am I talking about this in a you know, panel on US and China? Because from 1G to 4G, you know, these kinds of foundational critical technologies have been developed in global standards. 5G, is, same thing is happening. 6G, same thing is going to happen. And we have seen an increasing rise in participation from China, investment from China. To be sure, you know, governments around the world understand the importance of these critical technologies. You know, from uh, US, EU, China, India, Japan, Vietnam, everybody recognizes the importance of leading in 5G, having that 5G competence as a part of their tech sovereignty program. But right now, when it comes to going to the standards bodies where rubber meets the road, let me just share with you, you know, this is a real uh, technological arms race. There's a real competition. US is in the lead right now. EU is in the lead right now, as it has been for 1G to 4G standards. But that leadership is ours to lose if we are not careful. And I think we, you know, being careful is important right now because uh, although we understand the importance of leadership in these technologies, that's, you know, understood by this administration, it's understood by the previous administration, it's written in, you know, the recent executive order of uh, President Biden on promoting competition in the United States. In, you know, exactly at the same time, we are missing some important pillars that enable leadership in these kinds of critical technologies, not just 5G, but other emerging technologies. And that is intellectual property. How is all this innovation happening? You know, I think Elizabeth, you pointed out, you know, we, there's sort of this kind of a different mechanism in which innovation happens in different economic structures. We have been living in this economic structure where innovation happens based on a market-based economy. We need returns on investment. We are not 
you know, companies like ours aren't depending on state subsidies or some kind of big government grants. We are depending on returns from the market. So what we do is, you know, we invest over 20% of our revenues back in R&D uh, every year. And uh, that enables us to take very risky long-term bets, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years in advance before you think of, hear about the next G, the tinkering in the lab has already begun. And some of those risks are uh, those that don't uh, become successful, others become successful. But if they do, we can then broadly license intellectual property patents and get some return on the investment for those early risky bets and then continue to basically uh, the cycle of investment. If that virtuous cycle is broken, you can't really reconstruct it back. There is, it's a kind of a one-way slippery slope for losing leadership in these sort of critical technologies that develop over generations. So I think if we don't understand that IP is the linchpin to driving competitiveness, driving technology leadership in very important technology areas like 5G and many others, uh, that leadership is ours to lose. I hope we can continue this discussion um, as the panel progresses. Great. Thank you very much, Kirti. Appreciate your comments and observations, and we'll appreciate your perspective of these discussions from your technology and policy and business expertise. So thank you for that. And actually, you segue into our first question with your opening remarks, Kirti, and that is, um, you know, is, is the U.S. at risk in losing its leadership in innovation and competitiveness in tech sectors to China, or has it already lost its competitiveness in certain areas, at least? Maybe, Kirti, if you want to pick up from what you started with your opening remarks. Yeah, so I, I think what we are seeing is, you know, real as real um, investment in effort from China across various kinds of technology standards. And I'm sure, you know, others can remark in other technologies leading, you know, starting from 5G to AI, video codecs, connected cars, a whole range. Um, there's a difference between quality and quantity. And I think Elizabeth was alluding to that. There's still sort of this, uh, you know, currently China net net tech user, not IP user, not IP creator. Um, at least that's what we are seeing in the data. Uh, I think that's, that's true. Uh, but I, again, given the level of investment, um, I would ring some real alarm bells about ensuring that we preserve some important pillars that have led to this leadership until now and don't eviscerate them for specific concerns that can be addressed in a more surgical manner. I, from what I see, I, I see two areas where um, China has advantage uh, over US at this moment uh, in the tech space. Number one, Chinese, China is really good in skills things up and mass production in the sense that um, it can get things um, cheaper, faster, and, 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 and bigger in general. So, so that, that's one area. And second area, is the social driven, AI driven um, business model and surrounding technologies. So uh, two examples there. Um, Clay mentioned Meituan earlier. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with that. It is a food a delivery app. It's very popular in China. I have used that versus uh, door dash and other things, it, it's, it's miles, miles difference. In China, you can order food from tens of thousands of restaurants at 2 a.m. in the morning. It will deliver within 30 minutes and the charge of that delivery is like a dollar more. And compare that with what I see in the U.S., it, it, it's, it's it, it usually it take an hour and it charge extra 10 bucks for order of $20 and 
and they limit the choice of restaurants in that in, in that network. It's it, it, it's really um, uh, a, a proportion, not not even worth mentioning. So another example, social media. We we, we know about TikTok, or if we I watch a show on Netflix, I can see this. Uh, it, it, the social feature of the show in China, there's something called that mu. I know Mark, you can understand what I'm saying. It meaning that user can do real time comment on the show that's broadcasting and say, oh, I love this smile this actress just did, or I, there's something that's so funny about this. And there's so many of the user content can be can appear on uh, uh, when you're streaming immediately. And that's such a popular thing in China. I'm just saying that there are many area um, that the user interaction, the user feedback in, is incorporated in the, um, uh, in the platform. It's so much faster and more instantaneous uh, than what I see from the US counterparts. Um, so from, from that perspective, um, so there are advantages, what I see, but I want to remind something else from the economic basic concept, which is during international trade, different country or different company having their comparative advantage. The keyword is comparative advantage, not advantage per se, it's comparative. So, um, different country or different company are good at something, uh, not so good at other things. It's just normal uh, competition uh, with different perspective. And I, I just want to make sure we don't lose sight and seeing somebody else is doing, is better in something and that's necessarily something uh, alarming. Uh, back to you, Brian. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mark, any additional comments on that? Yeah, um, I'd like to kind of rip off of where Curti left off because there are a number of kind of uh, sub points uh, to her message. Um, you have a huge amount of patenting and a high amount of quantitative activity in China. And, and to read the press in the West, uh, we're going to be inundated, or we already are inundated, by China out-innovating us because China has so many more patents or scientific publications or PhDs or scientific institutions or uh, any number of other uh, uh, things. And, um, uh, and it is true. China has all those things. That doesn't mean it's a qualitative advantage. And that also doesn't mean that it isn't valuable in the game of international IP litigation or in getting a judgment in China regarding the value of your portfolio or in making it very difficult for a foreign country to enter the Chinese market when you have a huge basket of patents that you're threatening to assert. Uh, uh, and I think part of the problem in the West is we have what is now a very uh, uh, aggregated view uh, uh, a very non-granular view of uh, what is happening in China. I read, I read an article the other day, China threatens to dominate the world in AI patents. Well, AI is a basket of technology and the article was all about facial recognition technology. Now, China dominates in facial recognition technology. In fact, companies like Facebook are pulling out of that technology because of privacy concerns. But for China, this is a security and police issue. That's not necessarily the direction the United States is heading, but you have to disaggregate it and say, what is important to us and are we losing out in those areas? Uh, it's also really important when you look at what China's doing to reflect on things like um, our five-year plan, our Ministry of Science and Technology, our talent program. We have none of those, zero. Uh, uh, and China has those in abundance at a national and local level. And that is really what is feeding into these developments. And not only that, I think equally important for purposes of this discussion is that they have officials 
who really understand these issues. You know, uh, when I was in the government uh, the second time around and I met with Secretary Pritzker and I had my five minute elevator speech with her and I was thought very long and hard about what I was going to say to her as Secretary of Commerce about the Chinese IP regime. And I said, imagine, Madam Secretary, that you called up Mayor Bloomberg, who was then mayor at the time of New York, and you said, Mr. Mayor, I'm unhappy because New York only has 3.0 patents per 10,000 people, and the national goal is 3.3. And Secretary Pritzker looked at me and said, why the hell would I say that? I said, because if you don't understand that, that that is happening on a daily basis, and people are getting promoted on that basis, and companies are moving through the bureaucratic system to high-level jobs, the CEOs and state-owned enterprises are getting recognized. If you don't understand about how deeply that goes into China's system, that IP is now fully incorporated into its economic system, which has a tendency to create junk when the state gets involved, then you, you don't have a fair understanding of what's going on. We're not going to be overwhelmed by uh, uh, Chinese patents if we understand where the quality is, where the gold is, and where the lead is. But if we don't understand that, we're going to live in fear and have really hard time a very hard time engaging China in a way that protects our interests. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next question. And that is, what are the differences between the US and China in their approach of both their respective private sectors and governments towards strengthening their competitiveness and innovation? And as a follow-up to that, you, I think you've touched on this a little bit already in some of your comments to the first question is, how will economic nationalism either help or hinder um, advances in both countries? I would gently uh, defer on the point that, you know, uh, competitive advantage. Yes, of course, that's a great thing. But I think the underlying approach to innovation is so different that it's really not an apples to apples comparison. So what is the key difference in the U.S. and China approach? Look, you know, China has, let's talk about standards, a 2035 standards plan, a comprehensive innovation policy. Comprehensive policy on intellectual property. We have none of those things. You know, in our own executive order on competition, let me just go back to that as an example. There is this whole paragraph about recognizing the importance of leadership in critical technologies, areas, standards like 5G. And exactly in that same document, there is some reference to, hey, let's, you know, make sure that we regulate intellectual property, especially in the case of standards. <laughs> like, the two don't add up. So there is no coherence in terms of policy that we are promulgating to reach our overarching objectives. I think that's sort of, you know, one-on-one difference in approach. The other difference in approach is obviously, you know, market-driven versus, you know, we, like, I think I've already shared in this discussion, Brian, that, you know, uh, we live in a market-based economy. We are waiting and we're, we're entirely dependent on returns on investment from the market, not on anything else to be able to invest and innovate. And that's how the innovation agenda is set. It is set based on what do the consumers want, what's going to sell in the marketplace, not on other, you know, bases that are more centralized in nature or driven by a sort of a, overarching you know, central planner agenda. I think it's really important that we stay true to that. So you know, to the extent that we are now facing concerns in the antitrust IP community uh, about you know, big tech platforms, about um, a concentration of markets, some of those concerns are absolutely valid, but are the tools that we are approaching to address those concerns valid? I don't know. We gotta take a hard look at are we undermining our overarching goals? I, I just might, might add uh, 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 again to Curdy's comments that, um, you know, if you look at IP as one important aspect of this discussion, obviously very deep. Uh, we have yet to appoint a USPTO director. So we're a year into a, a four year administration. A quarter of the term of Biden has gone by. We've had uh, policies of the WTO on COVID-19. We've had this White House directive on competition. We have something new going on standards. 
And the one person who lives and breathes intellectual property, uh, 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 who could add something not only to those domestic issues, but also to the US-China trade war, has not yet uh, been appointed. Hopefully she's gonna have hearings tomorrow, but um, uh, uh, policy is already set without the benefit of information or expert information. Uh, and so we don't, you know, what do we have? Where I said it jokingly, where is that science and technology? Oh, we have an Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, very thinly staffed. Uh, 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 and we really don't have uh, 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 the folks who are looking at civil technology. If you go to DOD, you'll find there's a lot of people following security issues. But the, the civil technology and uh, the very close gap uh, that now ex exists between um, civil and, and security issues. Uh, we're, we're aware of it, but we really don't have the people who understand how technology works. And frankly, the delay in appointing a PTO director is a very good indicator of that. Another indicator, by the way, is at the same time as the US was weakening patent protection through Supreme Court decisions on areas like AI, software patents, genetic inventions, the same time, almost as if China was saying, I see an opportunity. China was strengthening those protections. Uh, uh, and it, it was possible, and I believe it still is possible, to secure patents in China on technology that you cannot secure in the United States. Uh, uh, and that's really, I think, not because the Supreme Court, which made those decisions, was um, uh, ill-intentioned, but really they didn't understand what the technologies of the, of the future are. And no one was really in a position to well advise them. Uh, uh, so you know, these are fundamental structural issues. Uh, uh, I know, Brian, when you and I were uh, serving the government, actually a few years later, I did a survey of uh, trade officials in USG, not just USTR, but commerce and other agencies. It's around 2008. How many of them spoke Chinese? And I think there were two, and I was one of them. Uh, 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 so Again, you know, the, the, the language expertise, the area studies expertise, the technical expertise, whether it's economics or STEM, uh, uh, makes it very hard to craft the right kinds of policies. Uh, and I think they've become especially critical. China has cultivated those talents. They've been sending them to the best schools, like in the US, but um, uh, the US is not, that's also been uh, uh, contributing to our weakness. Um, I, I want to, um... Um, welcome what Curti just said a little bit earlier. That's what she said, it was spot on. So the difference in my mind between the US approach and Chinese approach on how to um, uh, uh, stimulate innovation, it, it's a very different approach. The Chinese approach, government planned, very focused and pre-selected national champion approach. Hmm. And the, at least from the government perspective, and the US, if I understand properly, is market-driven, diversified, and survival of the fittest type of approach. And um, so the key question is, what is the most efficient way to generate um, innovation, to allocate limited resources. I think that's the economic question and people have answered in the past. Meaning that in most situation, the invisible band slash competition market force, whatever you call it, is more efficient than government planning to allocate resources to stimulate innovation. I, and I fully understand the concern that the government planned pre-select national champion, a lot of resources piling on certain companies that may generate some short-term advantage. It's possible. But in the long run, the market-driven, Curti mentioned a little bit earlier, get the proper rate of, rate of returns through market competition, at least economic theory explained to us, that's more sustainable, sustainable and health in the long run. And this point has been asked and to me empirical test in China already. That's why I mentioned earlier in China, there are two group of companies out there, state owned enterprises versus pri private companies. 
uh, and using those example and state-owned enterprises, they're planned, invested by government. In contrast, the private companies, they're less so um, in terms of government planning, resource allocation, all that stuff. So if you look at right now in a tech space, which companies are more successful? And you heard about TikTok, Tencent, Alibaba, Huawei. Those are private companies. Those are not state-owned enterprises. And the, the economic theory told us the inefficiency caused by the planning and uh, the thing that Mark mentioned earlier, those are very true and out there. So the concern of whether the market signal, the market competition would lead to best results, at least in the long term, from inside China already, we see is actually market competition wins out. I just want to point that out. Thank you. And I think all of you have, have really clarified and explained in great detail the key differences between the two approaches between China and the U.S. in terms of market and incentivizing and spurring innovation um, and technological advances. It seems to me that there, there could be an argument made that although the U.S. may have separate policies, as Mark pointed out, you've got these different policies that have been laid out both domestically and internationally, but yet they don't have the leadership to implement them or to develop them more fully. It seems to me that the U.S. currently doesn't really have a viable policy to maintain or strengthen its competitiveness in innovation in key tech sectors. In your view, what would be some concrete uh, proposals or solutions that, would, that the U.S. should uh, consider to, to strengthen its competitiveness in innovation vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, you know, I'll take an initial crack at, crack at this, although I'm, I'm hardly the, in the leading scholar on U.S. innovation policies, but well, let me say that the state should not be totally discounted, even though we rely on the market. And, and uh, you know, DARPA, uh, 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 you know, inventing the Internet, uh, finding the right balance between the role of the government and industry is, um, is really critical. I'd, I'd also like to add another point, though, on this balance between the state and the private sector. And I agree with what Elizabeth said about the efficiencies of the market. But, you know, we're... Uh, uh, 20 plus years into China's market reforms. And even now in legislation pending before the National People's Congress, uh, the legislators say we need to accelerate the leading role of the market. Uh, when China joined the WTO, the fundamental assumption was that China was going to become a market-oriented economy. And in fact, uh, um, and you'll remember this better than me, I think, Brian, but in fact, and that was the reason we expected that we wouldn't have special treatment under our dumping and countervailing duty laws after a 15 year sunset period. China won't need that because the steel industries, the heavy state invested sectors will all be uh, run by market forces. Uh, uh, of course, no one, I think, really took seriously the possibility that intellectual property or innovation would also be run by non-market forces, or that the patent system would be heavily dependent on subsidies, which it has been, uh, 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 and what that might mean uh, 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 to the Chinese domestic market or how foreigners are treated. That was really not under contemplation. And this is a, kind of a fundamental contradiction, to use a concept used by Chairman Mao, uh, between what the Western expectation was of China's economy at what China has been and more recently has reinforced, which is really an important leading role of the state and of the party. And in, particularly in the past two to three years, we've seen the party come out even more directly and openly uh, to champion innovation policies, to champion state intervention and the like. And that is uh, on the one hand, at least as a little bit more transparent, but on the other hand, it's troubling. You're not going to have independent courts. You're not going to be treated fairly as a foreigner, or at least there's that tremendous fear. And although, you know, an Alibaba or Tencent may be privately oriented and uh, uh, have a certain uh, advantage in the Chinese market, when it comes to a Facebook or a, a Netflix competing in China, uh, they're going to be at a major disadvantage against a private champion such as an Alibaba or Tencent. Uh, at least that will be perceived, and that will certainly be the case in market access and intellectual property and other areas. 
Uh, so it's not, uh, w- once the state is that deeply involved, the way it affects the market is m- multifold uh, uh, and, and sometimes unseen. Uh, 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 and that makes it very, very difficult, I think, for uh, companies to fairly monetize their IP rights in China or to have a sense that they'll be treated fairly. They may have a, a greater fear than is the reality, but I can't even tell you that for certain because it's not a transparent system. And when you have a non-transparent system where a very large cohort, for example, cases are not published, then you naturally suspect that it's those unpublished cases, those decisions behind closed doors that are the ones that really matter, not the ones that are made available to the public. Kirti, do you have some thoughts on perhaps some concrete solutions or at least proposals that the U.S. government should consider? You know, uh, from a, from from the perspective of um, technology, IP, and standards, I think that it would we've got to have a comprehensive innovation policy, and we've got to have a comprehensive policy on standards. When it comes to IP, antitrust, these are legal tools, and they should be incorporated. I mean, they should be used to advance the agenda of innovation policy, of technology policy, not the other way around. They are the tools that need to be used towards reaching the goals and not determine where we need to reach. So, you know, let me let me just uh, make this a little bit more concrete. For example, if we have a comprehensive innovation policy that says we must lead in you know, 5G, AI, semiconductor supply chain. These are the five steps we need to take. Part of which could be, let's talk about standards. You know, if we need to lead in 5G standards, we must ensure number one, a strong intellectual property pillar. Because if, you know, US companies don't have a way to invest in these technologies, they will not go to these standards bodies and they will not lead in that, period. Second, we must advance a rules-based ecosystem so that we play on a level playing field with China, with others in a global standard setting agent, in, in, in global standard setting institutions. Uh, we must make sure that the you know, governance principles are strong, that everybody is playing by the rules of openness, transparency, fairness, consensus building, majority, clarify what those rules are so that nobody can game the system. We must ensure that standards should be global and there is multilateral cooperation to ensure that they're global so that state-driven innovation agendas cannot you know, rule the day. Then you talk about, okay, where does IP fit in? Where does antitrust fit in? But right now, I think we don't have a comprehensive innovation policy. We don't have a comprehensive standards policy. We have things like, you know, uh, an executive order on some something that relates to antitrust, and we talk about innovation policy in that context. It's the other way around. Thanks, Kirti. Um, Elizabeth, what do you, in your thoughts, um, on what are the key factors for U.S. competitiveness and innovation vis-a-vis China? What would be some of the key factors for the U.S. to consider, or you know, again from the Chinese perspective? Um, I think this the, the, the strongest factor that would make American great, not again American great to begin with, <laughs> is is this um, is mature and efficient market that's open and fair and efficient in both physical capital and human capital. And um, my, I came from China. My American dream is that I can come to US, compete on merit, and it doesn't matter where I come from, who I know, and who I associate with. And to me, Uh, My favorite TV show is the Shark Tank and where it's such a beautiful illustration what an efficient and a mature market look like. And there, if something is disrupting that market, it's both in terms of human capital as well as physical capital, 
if something is disrupting that, I think that's such a such a big loss um, to the U.S. And my personal view, China doesn't have that. If U.S. can keep doing that, keep maintaining that efficient and uh, market force, whatever area it put into, it's going to be great. That, that's just my personal view. Um, I want to pick up on something that both uh, Kirti and, and Mark have referred to, and that is that uh, you know earlier this year, President Biden issued an executive order to promote or to allegedly promote competition in a wide range of sectors, including tech. But I think there's been some concern among certain technology companies about how effective or how much of a hindrance this might be. Um, what impact will this executive order have on U.S. leadership in innovation and its competitiveness in key tech sectors? Kirti? Sure, I, I can start. I think, uh, you know, Frankly, the purpose of the executive order seems to have been concerns vis-a-vis -vis big tech platforms, um, the you know fangs or the GAFA companies as we call them. Uh, apart from you know this coming out of context without having an innovation policy that this is somehow supporting or not, um, I think that you know that there are some significant causes of concern we should flag um, and. They relate to this sort of, it's woven in uh, at several points in the executive order that we should be limiting intellectual property rights, access to them, their enforcement or in, like, enhancing the regulation of IP in areas like standards or drugs or agriculture um, in different parts of the executive order. And that's somehow meant to promote competition. And I think that's a significant cause of concern because uh, you know, the IP community of small inventors, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, universities, they have spoken up again and again and again in support of intellectual property rights because that is the only way they have to protect their ideas. Traditionally, it's the FANGs or the GAFA companies, the big tech platforms that you know, the executive order has a beef with. They're the ones who benefit from weakening intellectual property rights that the executive order is trying to do. So it's a little confusing why you know, this policy directive that is trying to rein in the power of the big is actually giving them a gift. The big have other ways to protect their ideas. And that's why they don't like IP. They don't like the idea of having, you know, this process of uh, Schumpeterian process of creative destruction where <laughs> good ideas can come from anywhere and it can threaten the status quo. They have means of vertical integration. They have means of, you know, productizing their ideas and a first mover advantage. They have, you know, monetization of their ideas to adjacent markets, conglomerate effects, all kinds of means to be able to protect their ideas that the small don't. And that's why the smaller, you know, the NVCA has written papers most recently about their concerns with these kinds of proposals, the National Venture Capitalist Association. The, the inventor community has written their, you know, papers in uh, with concerns about these kinds of proposals. So, you know, the it's the small guys, it's the innovators that are really concerned about weakening of intellectual property rights because that is leading us to exactly the system where only the big will have the privilege to innovate. And in that system, by the way, where only the big, the vertically integrated have the privilege to innovate, the state-driven economies have a natural advantage. I, I find myself uh, uh, speaking on Curdy's uh, coattails, but uh, uh, that, that's okay. Uh, I, the um, I, 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 Curdy makes some very important points, and I, and I think uh, uh, it's actually an area that's often neglected in the United States about how our innovation system, ecosystem, has uh, uh, kind of neglected the smaller startups uh, and the smaller VC firms and the like, even though in the back of most people's minds, this is Thomas Edison or Hewlett and Packard or Bill Gates that somehow uh, began the garage and, and made their way to uh, becoming multi-billionaires. Uh, uh, but the reality is we have a system that is highly corporatized uh, uh, and where a lot of the big companies view IP as a bit of a nuisance. They don't need it 
that much to maintain maintain their dominance. Uh, I, I, and in that sense, um, it, 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 it's it's a it's a kind of a weakness on the U.S. side. Uh, I, I think also the 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 Biden announcement, just to dwell on one small area uh, that was also contradictory, was this area of non-compete agreements. They they wanted the FTC to investigate uh, the anti-competitive effect of non-compete agreements. The idea being that uh, you know uh, full labor mobility will make a more competitive economy. Uh, which is exactly the law in California, where non-compete agreements are generally illegal. Uh, the problem with that is if you have an employee uh, who goes and leaves their employer, let's say a California company today, taking trade secrets and goes to China, for example, uh, uh, and the non-compete is ineffective, you have no way other than bringing a trade secret case to pursue that individual. And those types of cases have happened in California in the semiconductor sector in particular. Uh, uh, so it, it's again, a bit of a, of, of a blindness or deafness regarding the international uh, implications of uh, weakening the IP system, of uh, weakening uh, uh, our system with regard to non-competes, of ramping up against some of our competitive companies using antitrust where occasionally it might be inappropriate, uh, 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 that, um, we're not looking at the international consequences. Uh, I also, if you don't mind, I wanted to, Debbie Seligson raise some questions online. And if I can, I just want to somewhat related to this. Uh, she asked, uh, 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 she thought that I was being perhaps too black and white in uh, describing uh, uh, the US as market oriented and um, China as being state oriented. Uh, uh, after all, uh, uh, all IP rights, actually most IP rights, not all IP rights, are granted by the state. Uh, in some cases, they're protected by the state, but not all IP rights are granted by the state. But uh, nonetheless, copyright subsists without formalities, trade secrets are not granted by the state. Uh, uh, but even accepting that premise, um, uh, there I think are objective indicia of the hand of the state in China that don't exist in the US and don't exist even in economies like in Europe, which do have a more active state role. Uh, for example, until recently, most of the IP enforcement in China, quantitatively, was undertaken by the state. Uh, that is by state administrative agencies. Uh, and to this day, the level of criminal enforcement in China, as I mentioned earlier, is about 60 times the size of, of uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, also, subsidization of patents and trademark filings or participation in standards is a statist role. Goals regarding ownership of patents and trademarks per 10,000 people at 10,000 enterprises is a status goal. We don't have those things, nor, nor in fact, uh, did China traditionally have strong civil remedies with adequate compensation. When Qualcomm was a subject of a state-sponsored antitrust investigation where damages, I believe, were about $875 million, that was roughly 60,000 times average civil damages in a patent lawsuit in China. So there you have it. When the state is pursuing you, $875 million. When you bring a private patent lawsuit, $20,000. That's how the state plays out its heavy hand, where it's enforcing what it wants, it piles on the penalties, but in order to have a robust civil compensation system where you can protect your rights, uh, uh, where you can monetize the rights because they're well protected, where you have functioning markets. That's where China has had to struggle because the state is so actively involved. So I, I do think this is an area where there are shades of gray uh, 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 and IP is still basically a property right. Yes, it is true that property rights are dependent upon the state, but there are systems that are more private property oriented and many that are less. And certainly North Korea, which by the way, has a patent law uh, uh, and protects patents in its constitution is probably much less protective of IP as a private property right than China. And, and the days to quibble over, you know, property rights and IP and its importance and its merits are over. We're talking about a technological arms race. We're talking about tools in the toolkit that we need to use one way or another to win the race, period. Right. That's what this is about. So, you know, we need to have 
okay, what's our innovation agenda lead in these technologies? What do we need? We need IP, we need this, we need that, we need these tools. Okay, let's get those tools. We can't have technocrats run the show say, oh yeah, we need to you know, put antitrust here and devalue IP there and to help with the innovation policy and the broader goals. I, I just have a very small point, which is completely different from uh, the, 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 the IP perspective uh, and more on the innovation part. I mean, my, my reading is probably my very narrow reading of the, the, the executive order is that it, it appeared to me, it focused a lot more on distribution rather than uh, efficiency issue. So um, that there are uh, talking about um, uh, how antitrust or competition is to solve the um, reallocation of things, which in my mind that's called distribution. And um, traditionally competition uh, is to promote innovation, which is to make the pie bigger rather than focus on how do we slice and dice who get the bigger piece of a given pie. So that, that's just, that's all I'm, my observation is. Right on. <laughs> you know, we can talk about trend distribution, we will live out it all day, but at the same time, we're losing, losing the pie to competition. <laughs> No, very interesting discussion on that and different perspectives, much appreciated. I know we're running out of time and I know that we've got some several great questions from the audience. So let me raise one more question, um, if I may. All of you have stressed the extreme importance of, of strong intellectual property rights protection and its key you know, um, uh, role that it plays in terms of spurring and protecting innovation and competitiveness, in the especially in the tech sectors. You know, we hear about, we Mark, you know, very clearly outlined the problems and the challenges that we, that companies face in China, the current IPR regime there. Has there been any progress? I know it's been, a, Mark, you know this firsthand more than anybody here, you know, that this has been a longstanding concern and focus of the right. U.S. Yeah. Has there been any improvement or, uh, you know, for example, there was the phase one trade agreement last year that had certain commitments. Um, is there so, any improvement? In, is there something, I'm sorry. Is there, what are the key concerns that U.S. companies should still be aware of in going into China, working in China? Well, I, I think without a doubt, the system has improved. So I, uh, I, I, I suppose that's the good news. The bad news is that the, uh, the areas of concern are where there's more uh, 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 existential uh, uh, threats like uh, the U.S. technological competitiveness. We were, we were never going to be uh, 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 strategically undermined uh, by uh, counterfeit, uh, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton bags, you know, or, or 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 some of the other uh, consumer goods or luxury goods. But when it comes to technology and economic espionage and antitrust, uh, if it's misapplied and all all, all that, it, it has a, a much more existential impact upon the U.S. But you know, in terms of the functioning of the IP system, China has. You know, specialized IP courts, a new national appellate IP court. The pa I have to say, I teach Chinese IP at Berkeley, and I'm dreading teaching in January because every major IP law has been revised in the last two years. The patent law, the trademark law, the copyright law, the trade secret law, the antitrust law is being revised. There's a new plant variety law, as well as regulations and judicial guidance and cases. It is absolutely astronomical. And this was done without the pressure of joining the WTO. This was done largely in response to China's own uh, domestic, its consideration of its own domestic needs. Now, the phase one agreement brought a lot of positive changes, uh, increased damages, possibilities for punitive damages, an increase in criminal enforcement, uh, some special campaigns. And I'm mentioning all of those at the outset because those were the easy ones, even though people in the US may view it otherwise. Those are the ones where the state is actively involved. This is kind of Cohen's hypothesis, I'm drilling it in. But the reality is China is always interested in improving the state's role in managing IP. And that's what we got out of China in the phase one agreement in large part. Do we still have complete transparency of court decisions? Absolutely not. Do we know how every case is being decided? Do we get copies of preliminary injunctions when they're rendered? Absolutely not. Uh, 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 so some of the other things that go into a functioning civil system, and China is a very, very big civil system, over 400,000 cases a year, which I guess is probably roughly 40 times the size of the United States. We don't have a really good window into it. Uh, and I think some of the things that have been neglected, 
what I used to call orphaned back in 2004 uh, 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 are coming to haunt us. We didn't talk about patents with China bilaterally to any great degree until the past five or 10 years. We hardly talked about trade secrets with China. We certainly rarely talked about industrial policy uh, uh, or commercializing or licensing technology and having a good market for that. Those were not top core issues. We were concerned about trademark counterfeiting and uh, uh, knockoffs of Hollywood movies. Important issues, particularly down in Los Angeles. I'm not gonna disparage the movie or recording industries, but uh, the high tech sector, whether it is uh, uh, high tech and 5G and IoT or the technology sectors, whether it's uh, material science or biotech, we're not really front and center of that equation. And that's the area that's really, really important and demands a much higher level of sophistication. Uh, you know, our foreign, our foreign patent applicants being treated fairly in China. There's some data that suggests that where a patent is incorporated into a standard, the likelihood that that patent will be granted in China is lower than uh, if a Chinese applicant uh, apply for that patent or compared to other technologies. Uh, that is really significant information in terms of the kinds of industrial sectors that Curdy works on. Uh, 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 similarly, there's data that says the same thing about biotechnology, that foreign biotech pharma patents uh, are being discriminated against in favor of Chinese applicants. Do we know what happens in the courts? No. Now, we are 20 years into China's WTO accession. And for us to still be wondering, when are we going to get all the court cases? How are we going to determine whether we're being treated fairly is not uh, uh, the sign of great success in our trade negotiations. We should know more. And those issues were not part of the phase one agreement. Elizabeth, I know you focus on IP issues um, in your work at, with Compass Lexicon. Um, any, any thoughts or observations about you know, how it's improved or what US companies should still be wary of? Right, I, I was remembering back what um, Mark mentioned earlier that uh, the statistics show that um, the, the, the win rate for the patent litigation in China for non-US, non-Chinese companies is higher, um, that comment. And that actually that statistics I heard from Mark four years ago, and um, uh, I, I still remember he said, US companies go to China and, and do your litigation and assert your right there. Um, and, and at least from the very little data that I observe, which is um, similar to what we uh, Curti mentioned a little bit earlier, this standard essential patents um, uh, litigation in China, I do see, at least now compared to four years ago, uh, more non-Chinese companies are getting uh, involved in the litigation in China. So that's this little data point um, to, to for what, what I observe. Uh, the second observation I see is that I mentioned earlier that um, IP protection issue, is it China issue or is it, um, are you the creator versus are you the user of the intellectual property right? And um, my hypothesis is that if you, you are the owner or creator of intellectual property right, uh, you have more incentive to protect it versus um, if uh, you're just purely the, the user. So uh, what I observe is that um, Chinese companies, those are creating or owning intellectual property rights, especially patent rights. They, I see, what I see is they start to use patent litigation to protect their patent rights. So that general direction, if, Chinese companies owning more patents, owning more intellectual property right, then they should respect or protect IPR more. And I do see that moving toward that direction too. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Kirti, we, have, we only have a couple minutes, but if you wanted to add anything, I apologize for that. But. I'll just add a minute then, because I think Mark covered a whole bunch of, sort of the reality on the ground, right? Like we're still quibbling about where's the data to show whether we're being treated fairly. So there's like, there's really lack of information. But I would say that, you know, the, one of the most recent topics of conversation has been the use of anti-suit injunctions and anti-suit -anti injunctions in China to keep 
jurisprudence in China to keep the global rate setting in the context of standard essential patents and fran rates in China. So look, there's a game to be played here, and it's play it's being played well uh, by by China on all fronts. While we are here at kindergarten level talking about, hey, how do we, you know. Uh, use antitrust to regulate our patents in the space of antitrust, uh, in the space of standards, and how do we use um, other means to limit the patent eligibility, subject matter, and things like that. So we're not recognizing what's on the horizon. Thank you, Kirti. I uh, our time is up. Um, I'd like to thank our our panelists. Um, obviously, with a tremendous wealth of expertise, we appreciate you sharing your your observations and your insights and providing them for us with a very robust, interesting, and informative discussion. I apologize to the audience that there were some very good questions, but we didn't unfortunately have time to do that. But I think we all benefited from hearing what our three panelists had to say and share in their discussions. I'd like to thank Clay and the USC US China Institute for their collaboration in putting this program together. And with that, uh, thank you everyone, appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us.